Hi everyone, it's Jerry. This is game four of four from the match between Hikaru Nakamura and the world's top chess engine Stockfish. In this one, as you can see, Stockfish is without the B-pawn. Nakamura is playing on his own in this one with the white pieces. And again, for the most part, I'll simply be showing the moves to the game. So, game once again, just like in game three, where Stockfish was without the H-pawn, Nakamura starts with E4. Bishop b7, knight c3, a3, I guess just preventing any ideas of a pin against the knight, trying to get in a, an ideal pawn center. c5 is there to interfere with that idea. Knight f3, knight f6, reinforcing e4. Bishop e7, preparing now to fianchetto. Black now strikes right at the moment where this rook is vulnerable. Pawn takes, knight takes, knight takes, queen takes. White is there to, in time to defend the knight. White castles, knight d4, knight e1. Light square bishops get off the board soon in this one. Notice how you have to be very careful, maybe already at this point here. If you're taking the bishop, queen takes. This can maybe be a bit annoying to kick the knight. You know, if you're trying to do this, there's knight to b3. Maybe you're going to be weakened on the light squares. So instead, first doing something about the knight immediately with c3. Light square bishops come off. Now the knight has to react. Queen e2, preparing to lend some more support to d1 if needed, if there's more pressure on that square, with a, a rook placing itself to d8. Knights come off, which I think is a welcome sight. Rook on f to d1. More exchanges the better, since white has that pawn plus still. And I guess at this point preparing some break with d4, but notice at this point d4 can maybe always be met with c4, and then it's the b2 pawn that could be targeted since it's not so easily moved. Black would be clamping down on that square if there's a pawn on the c4 square. So rook c2. Eventually we have the white queens come off the board. So I think another welcome sight as more pieces are exchanged. Now the white king gets working so that there's a bit of a change of the guard here with the white king around to defend, let's say, the d3 pawn or the b pawn, which will allow the white rooks to do something a bit more active. So after a5, white does not want black to clamp down with a4, so a4 by Nakamura. e5. And what do we have just then? We had g5 and g4. So another another fixed pawn on a dark square. A welcome sight, I believe, on the white side. In an ideal world, if we look at what pieces would you like to exchange in such a position, if white can exchange both sets of rooks, this will be, I think, much simpler to play and I think there would be a very clear plan of the king getting to c4 and maybe even b5 or shifting over in the d5 square targeting any one of these four black pawns meanwhile there's not going to be on the white side any fixed pawns for this dark square bishop to target okay so king g6 h3 f3 the only thing that white does not have in this position is space. If we look at all of these pawns here, a lot of pawns on the fifth rank and the corresponding fourth rank, there's only a couple. So there's a slight space advantage. When we look at good and bad bishops, it's of course black who has the bad bishop, but these rooks are going to be more active, clearly, right? The rooks could get on a half-open file on the black side, whereas white is still strictly defensive, but white's still up the pawn. Okay, so after h5, bishop f2, keeping pressure on b2, and eventually there is going to be some progress made. Notice, after this h4 move, this is an interesting point, because now h3 is potentially at some point going to be a target to a black rook. 
So another another reason why as white you would really like to get the the rooks off the board at this moment here is because if the position does open up, and it's going to have to open up in some way if white is going to try to win, if the position does open up, you always have to be concerned about a black rook potentially targeting h3, and if he falls, well, he's just a few steps away from queening. He's very fast. So it's a long-term idea with this h4 move. If you're going to play this as black, you want to make sure you keep a rook around so that he remains a potential target. Okay, so bishop e1, you have to defend b2. King eventually gets to this a2 square. Slow and steady at this point right here. Black can really do nothing. If white wants a draw, you can get a draw just by going back and forth. This rook is perfect on this square. e4, keeping control of the fourth rank squares. You can go back and forth on these two if you really wanted to and just make sure you watch over your base point b2, the only point where there's some pressure. Okay, so rook d7, rook c4. Where is this next break going to happen? d4 it is. By move 52, we finally have some action, and the position opens up. Nakamura, just under 20 minutes. These are just to give you some indication of the time spent on each of these moves. So bishop takes. His pawn is pinned to the king. Rook d7, bishop back. And now we have finally the white rook getting active, but without the black, with this d file, I should say, now open, the black rook is now very active. This bishop can't move so easily. You drop f3 and then h3 soon enough. So you have to defend. Rook e1, king d7. This king, the white king has to go in a different direction. I, w I was thinking the white king would maybe want to go over on this side of the board to challenge the rook what would maybe have been wrong with king to b1 at this point there is rook d1 check and the rook is getting over here so that's probably not a good idea to make use of the b1 square so rook c5 instead rook b6 eventually the c pawn gets rolling he's set into action right now set into motion king d7 rook a8 He's there, defended by the bishop. The rook wants to stay active. Notice if we do a quick comparison, who has the more active rook? It's, of course, the white rook. White, of course, does not want to exchange it so easily. White, again, could if you wanted to have a draw, I believe. Just kind of going back and forth with the rook, keeping defense of the bishop, having the bishop keep defense of the pawn. I don't believe that would there would really be a way for black to make progress maybe black could well i'm not sure what exactly black would do to make progress still being down a pawn i think uh, they would be fine with going back and forth a little bit but something bad ends up happening there's a slight slip up here bishop c5 the evaluation is roughly equal but it starts to shift around this point here in fact after rook to b7 this was an interesting moment because it's reading, you, know, you can't see it in the video right now, but it's reading approximately minus one where black is saying it, that black is better. After this rook to b7 move, it's saying that black is better. What was being suggested here is to play a strictly defensive move. But after rook b7, it suggests rook takes f3, but that move wasn't played. I'm I, To be perfectly honest, I don't know why. I don't have an answer to that. <laughs> I'm not sure why rook takes f3 was not played here. Um, in, instead of instead of this bishop to d8 move, I I don't know. But following up, we have bishop a3. Bishop is just going back and forth. Rook to b3. Bishop c5. This pawn is going to be won now. After rook to d4, there you can't defend that a4 pawn. So that pawn is finally won back after 74 moves. Keep in mind Nakamura is under 5 minutes. So it's very easy to go wrong. It's very easy to go wrong against a computer if you have a lot of time. But now there's very little, very little time. Rook c4 to defend. You can't really... I mean, this pawn is passed, but he's, he just can't go anywhere. This bishop is keeping a close eye over him. So the rooks come off, b3, 
And eventually what we have is an imbalance where white gets the bishop, but black gets a ton of pawns. In fact, just a few more moves, what do we have? Four passed pawns. This is not going to turn out well for team white. Not enough. You have the king and the rook that can help these pawns get rolling. And that's exactly what happens. Black first making life a little bit more difficult for this pawn to even think about getting to the fifth rank. King b5, another check, king a4, the bishop backs up. g4, if you try to run right away, he's going to get right behind and, well, maybe this is still even winning, but the main point here is that just get him working with the main threat of if bishop takes pawn, now you could push and made a move like rook here with rook to h3, and this pawn will promote soon enough. So it's g4 on move 92, rook h7, rook f3. The king tries to get over in time, but these pawns are just too much. They get pushing, and after king to d5, Nakamura had enough and simply threw in the towel. There's not going to be a way to stop these pawns. As an example, if bishop to a5, there's f4, rook h4, there's rook a3, ideas of rook a2 check, Rook takes pawn. Well, you're attacking the bishop. I mean, what more can you do? Rook here, if the bishop, let's say, goes to b6 to watch over one of the promotion squares, there's h2. You can't take him because of a check. And, well, what else are you going to do? Bishop here. These pawns are just too much. They keep moving, and one of them is going to promote. And however you slice it, white is going to lose. So a very interesting game. Again, feel free to share a very interesting match starting out in games one and two having computer assistance and games three and four with uh, pawn odds. So feel free to share any feedback you have on this or what maybe might make an, an even more interesting match than the one we just saw here between Nakamura and Stockfish. So that's all for now. Hope you enjoyed all four games. And at the end of this video, I'll provide a link to a playlist where you can view all four games. That's all for now. Hope you enjoyed it. Take care. Bye.